but I can assure the comrades that, that what we're going to tell you today about the history of the Marxist movement is completely relevant, 100% relevant to the struggles that the working class faces today. And part of being a Marxist is learning to think historically, learning to think in terms of the long scale uh, of history. And part of that is because we want to know our enemy, who they are, but also where did they come from? Because the capitalists have got a history and we're gonna go into that as well. And from un that understanding, you can start to see how you would defeat, uh, how we will defeat uh, the capitalist class. Being a Marxist is also about thinking internationally because the story of our movement is a global one. Now we're going to look at Karl Marx where he said uh, that workers have no country. And what he meant is it's true you're born in one particular country but across the world we all have the same interests and we must unite and fight for those as part of a global uh, international uh, movement. And we'll also try and show how the ideas that have been developed through history inform the way we approach the struggle today. Now I know that the comrades regularly say we want comrade executive to come to our meeting or to come uh, to this struggle, they want the comrade there. Now that's because the comrade executive usually knows what to do. But the reason he knows what to do is because of the ideas that he's based on, the ideas that he's learned in uh, our organisation. Because what our ideas do is they give you a method of how you approach any new problem that workers face. So the EPWP, well that was created in 2013, but straight away we understand it and we know what we must do about it because of the ideas that we've developed over the past uh, 200 uh, years. And it's that method that we, we hope to try and start teaching the comrades uh, today. So to get started, um, the foundations of the Marxist Workers' Party's programme rest on the following ideas. There's six things there. Number one, we've got the ideas of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. We put those two together because they worked as a team uh, throughout their uh, time together. Now they go back a long way. Marx was born in 1818. So if he was still around today, he'd be 202 years old. Uh, Engels was born in 1820. Now number two there are the ideas of a, of a comrade called Vladimir Lenin, who was born in 1870 uh, in Russia. The third uh, guy there is Leon Trotsky, who was around at the same time as Lenin. Now Lenin and Trotsky worked together as well, like Marx and Engels, but Trotsky continued the work of Lenin and the work that Trotsky did in the last 15 years of his life after uh, Lenin had died were some of the most significant. So we put them as a uh, separate day. Then there's the first four congresses. Congress, you know, is a big, is a big meeting of an organization. The first four congresses of what was called the Communist International, which was an international working class uh, organization of revolutionaries. And its early years are still rich in lessons for us today. The fifth one there, again Trotsky comes back, was what was called Trotsky's left opposition, which he built within the first, within the Communist International when it started to go on the wrong uh, road. And then he founded a new international in 1938 called the Fourth International. And the sixth one there brings us up to the modern day, the Committee for a Workers International, which was founded in 1974, but it still exists today and it's the international to which the Marxist Workers' Party is affiliated. So those are the founding ideas, those six areas. And we believe that taken together, these ideas are the necessary guide to the struggle for nothing less than the liberation of humankind from poverty and from exploitation. However, it's impossible for us to talk of a single humankind or a united humankind in the capitalist society that we live in today. And that is because, as comrades have explained, capitalist society is divided into classes. We have the minority capitalist class, the bosses on the one side, and then we have the majority working class 
on the other side. And what you find, and we'll unpack this, is that what is good for the capitalists, EPWP, is bad for the workers, also EPWP. So for example, in, in the economy in general, the profits, uh, the bosses will make bigger profits the lower the wages they can pay the workers. But of course, workers resist this. And the result is a never-ending class struggle between the workers and the capitalists, uh, a struggle which is built into the very fabric of capitalist society. That's, of course, why the comrades here are having to take to the road of struggle uh, in the EPWP campaign. Unfortunately, although it might be the first time that you comrades have taken part in the struggle, struggle is the normal situation of the working class under capitalism. And of course, the exploiting capitalist minority, they've got no interest in giving up their privileges, in giving up their control of society. As comrades have said, they need to be forced to do that. And of course, the comrades in the EPWP, at least on a small scale, have already drawn that conclusion in the EPWP, because we haven't sat back, we've organised, we've gone to union buildings to put pressure on them to try and force them to give us uh, the permanent jobs. But therefore, what we take from that is that the task of liberating humankind falls to the working class specifically. The capitalist class won't uh, give up. So it falls to the comrades here and the millions of comrades in the rest of the country and the billions of workers around the world to liberate humankind. And in what direction must we look for liberation? Well, the answer is by struggling to replace capitalism with socialism. And socialism, to put it in its most basic idea, uh, is the abolition, the ending of private property in the economy. So we're not talking about your phone or your house if you're lucky enough to own one or your other personal belongings but private ownership private property in the economy because that is the source of the super wealth of the capitalist class and at the same time it's the source as we'll explain of the exploitation and the suffering of the working class now to put that idea in a specific policy of something we can actually do the foundation of socialism is the nationalisation of what we call the commanding heights of the economy. So the mines, the banks, the big factories, the big businesses, the big farms. Uh, probably really in South Africa, we're talking about the 300 biggest companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Of taking them out of the hands of the capitalists, the shareholders, the CEOs, and making them the property of society as a whole. Now what would that mean if we did that? It would mean that what is called profit today and which goes straight into the pockets of the rich uh, and used to pay the CEOs their bonuses, uh, used to pay dividends to the shareholders who've never even come to South Africa before. Instead that money would become a huge social fund and if that was under the control of the working class, then we could use that wealth, which was created by the comrades, by the workers, to invest and to develop industry, to create jobs, to raise wages, to build houses, schools, clinics, hospitals, roads, and deliver the high quality health care, education, and other social services that the working class needs. Socialism would mean ending the competition that exists in the economy between the different different capitalist companies. You know, you have ShopRite, Checkers, Woolworths, all competing for you to go and buy your food from them. Instead of that competition, we would replace that with a democratic plan of production to ensure that the needs of everyone are met. And this would be organised under the democratic control of the working class. We're going to explain all this. I'm just giving you the overview. The reorganisation of society in this way would not be able to stop at the borders of South Africa. Socialism can't be built in one country on its own. It must be done on a global scale. Um, and that's because capitalism has already created a world economy. You can't turn things backwards from where they are uh, now. Every national economy, including South Africa, is just one piece, one small piece of the world economy. 
To give an example, make that uh, concrete. South Africa, for example, is the world's top platinum producer. And I expect most of us don't even know what platinum is for. It's, it's used in uh, different chemical processes. So if you want to make other materials, you have to add a small amount of platinum and it causes a reaction and so on. So it's used across all different industries. And it's also used in uh, the catalytic converters in cars, you know, the thing that sucks out the most poisonous gases. So we have got most of the platinum uh, in the world, more than could ever be used on a local basis. On the other hand, uh, South Africa has got no oil. We don't have any oil in the country. And oil is used to make petrol for your cars. It's used to make every single plastic product as well. So like things like the TV, they're made of plastic today. The chairs, without oil, you can't make any of those things. So without the world economy, South Africa would have mountains of platinum, which we couldn't use, and would have no oil for petrol, plastics, uh, and so on. So in the 21st century, no society can unplug from the world uh, economy if it wants to enjoy you know, all the benefits of a modern uh, economy. And socialists, we don't propose that. The only way forward for humanity, we argue, is to push forward to a world socialist plan of production based on the voluntary cooperation of all of the peoples of the planet. So comrades, that's the, in a nutshell, the Marxist view of humanity's socialist future. And the foundations of our program, these six ideas, they supply us, we would argue, with all the ideas necessary, with the roadmap of how to carry out that transformation in society. Um, so we could say that the history of the revolutionary program is at the same time the history of the preparation of the working class to carry through the socialist transformation of society, to carry through the socialist revolution. Now, as we've discussed in the, in the last session, the comrades, you experience the class struggle every day. That's how you've come to be here, by taking part in the struggle, most of you, of the EPWP uh, uh, campaign. So it isn't the task of the party to explain to you, or rather to tell you that you're exploited. The task of the party is to turn you into a what we call a class-conscious cadre of the socialist revolution, to give you the ideas of Marxism, so that you're taking part in the struggle, understanding it, and taking part in a conscious way, understanding the whole history uh, of the movement. And before I go any further now, I just want to stress that we've called this a brief history of the revolutionary program and the international movement. But we call it brief because we'll only have time to give comrades an overview. We won't have time to drill down right to the bottom of all of them. So by the end of today, the comrades may have more questions than when you came in. But don't let that uh, put you off. Don't let that uh, discourage you, comrades. Because in future day schools, we're going to drill down into all the different ideas here in more detail. What we want to do today is give the comrades the bird's eye view uh, of all the ideas. But if you're at least familiar with the key names that I've just introduced and with the key events and how they all fit together, you'll have a solid foundation for learning more in, uh, in, in the future. So we're going to start with Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Now Karl Marx especially is, is the father of what we would call scientific socialism. Uh, and that is simply another name for Marxism. And we're going to join Marx in February of 1848, which is about 170 years ago. Uh, he was 30 years old at that time. And along with Engels, they were, they were about to publish uh, a small book, a pamphlet, that is called the Communist Manifesto, which is, is very famous in the workers' movement. If you're around in the workers' movement for more than a few months, you'll end up hearing about the Communist Manifesto. But before we look at what they said in the Communist Manifesto, we need to say a few words about what was happening in Europe, which is where they're from, they're both born in Germany, I'll show some maps in a minute, of what was happening in Europe at this time. Because 1848 was a year 
of revolutions uh, in Europe. A revolutionary wave that we call the springtime of peoples was sweeping across uh, the continent. The, the French monarchy in, in the country of France was overthrown on the 24th of February in 1848. And the next month, during the so-called March days, governments were overthrown in Germany, in Austria, in Italy, in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, in Poland, and in Romania. However, uh, at this time, those modern con countries that I just mentioned, but in 1848, those countries didn't uh, exist yet. Europe was dominated by a handful of empires. On the, you had uh, the Russian Empire, this big empire here. You had the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is this big blue one here. And then down in here, you had the Ottoman Empire. None of those exist today. But at that time, Europe was dominated by those three empires. But also on the other side, it was uh, broken up into tiny countries, what we call statelets or principalities. So on the one hand, you had these huge empires. On the other hand, in what is modern day Germany, <laughs> Germany today is a very powerful country. But in 1848, there were 39 different countries that, where modern day Germany is. And then also Italy was also broken into uh, a dozen uh, small uh, countries. Now, in 1848, the people of Europe were fighting for national liberation from those empires. I know it's funny now to think of Europeans struggling for national liberation, because that's what the Africans had to do a hundred years later. But the same thing had to happen in Europe as well. So those countries that I mentioned, it's, uh, Austria, the Czech Republic, Poland, they were fighting for their national independence from those, uh, those large empires. They were also fighting uh, for national unity. In Germany and Italy, they all spoke the same languages. They wanted to unite into one country, but the local rulers wanted to keep their own small countries that they could control. Um, what was a common feature of all of the revolutions across Europe was that the masses, the people, were also fighting for democratic rights. Again, sounds familiar with the struggle of South Africa and Africa. People wanted to have the vote. They wanted everyone to be able to vote for the government. They wanted elected parliaments. They wanted freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and all of these uh, different freedoms that most countries, well, I don't know if that's accurate, actually, but many parts of the world today do, uh, do have. But within 18 months of those revolutions beginning, all of the governments that were overthrown had come back. The only exception was the French king, and there's reasons for that which we don't have time to go into. But all of those governments were back in power. So in other words, the revolutions were defeated. And understanding why the 1848 revolutions were defeated is crucial to understand why uh, Marxism emerged when it did, because of, as I said, Marx published the Communist Manifesto the same year as these revolutions. So understanding why Marxism emerged and also why it caught on very quickly amongst the workers in Europe. Why, when they heard the ideas, many of them rallied to the ideas uh, of Marxism. Now, you might notice I started with Marx. I haven't explained what he said yet. I took one step back, but now I'm going to take another step back. Because before we can go forward, we need to look at some other features of the 1848 revolutions. And we need to ask first, who were the revolutionary forces. Who was trying to make the revolution? And it was what we could loosely call a cross-class movement. And what were the classes that were trying to make the revolution? It was the working class on the one hand, and then it was also, wait for it comrades, it was the capitalist class on the other hand. Yeah. <laughs> they, at that time in history, the working class and the capitalist class had a common enemy, what we call the feudal ruling class. This was made up of emperors, of kings, and of, of, of lords. Um, they, they don't exist in most countries uh, anymore. So the comrades, you know, might be very surprised to hear that in 1848 the capitalists were fighting in a revolution. Because of course today, we, the working class, are trying to make a revolution to get rid of the capitalist class. But if you go far enough back in history, 
The capitalist class, when it was young, was also a revolutionary class. Now, today, capitalism, it dominates the world so securely, so strongly, that it can seem as though it's been there forever. But capitalism isn't actually that old. Uh, it only conquered political power for the first time about 350 years ago. And for a long time after that first conquest of power, it still only existed in one or two countries. Because you see, comrades, that capitalism, it's not the first type of society that's divided into classes. Uh, other class societies with an exploiting minority and an exploited majority came before it. So, as I said, in Europe, feudalism was the class society that came before capitalism. And the feudal ruling class was in power for about a thousand years uh, before capitalism. And their power was based on their control of the land. Their rule was undemocratic and oppressive. As they saw it, they had been appointed by God to rule society, what they called the divine right of kings. And they were answerable only to God. The people didn't come into it. They didn't have to explain anything to the people. And the people, the vast majority of the people under feudalism, were what we call uh, serfs, not smurfs, uh, serfs. Um, and they were a kind of uh, unfree peasant. Now they were part and parcel of the land that was owned by the feudal ruling class. You couldn't separate them. And the serfs were forced to provide free labour to the feudal ruling class, as well as pay taxes uh, on the land and other obligations. And in exchange for this, for working for free for the feudal lords, they would be given access to some of the land to grow things for themselves, to meet their own needs, to have a place to build their house, to make their own furniture, uh, and so on. But even then, part of that produce could be demanded by the feudal lord at any time. Um, so serfdom was only one step away, really, from outright uh, slavery. From the 14th century, this is as far back as I'll go, Feudalism, in Western Europe at least, so Britain, France, uh, the Netherlands, feudalism was in, in decline. The system was breaking down and had entered a crisis. We don't have time to explain why, but it's an interesting story. But out of that crisis that was developing, that's where the capitalist class began to emerge from. And over the next 300 years, so from 1300 to 1400, over the next 300 years, the capitalist class began to develop and they emerged from what we call the medieval merchants, so people that lived in the small towns of the time, buying and selling things, uh, especially in Italy, that country we looked at here, they had lots of small independent cities that were their own republics and they were dominated by merchants and their wealth was slowly building up. But on the other hand, especially in Britain, the the capitalists were emerging from uh, wealthier farmers and uh, richer peasants who had been freed from serfdom as, as the system began to break, uh, break down. So from the late 14th century, capitalism was beginning to develop across Western Europe within the belly of feudalism. So feudalism still existed, but capitalism was developing within it. A class of rich people were beginning to uh, develop. Now, just a quick word of caution, because I'm calling this new class that is emerging uh, the capitalist class, but that's not entirely accurate. It might be better to say that these old style capitalists were the immediate ancestors of today's modern uh, capitalists. Uh, another way to put it might be that the feudal ruling class and the capitalist class were completely different species. But the early capitalists, they might look different, but they got the same DNA as the modern capitalists. They're the same species even if they might look different. I don't know, like a, a wolf and a domestic dog, same species, but they have different ways of getting their dinner. And as this emerging capitalist class grew in wealth, they kept knocking up against the limitations of feudal society. And the main problem for them was that what makes a capitalist a capitalist is that other than owning parts of the economy, they employ people to work for them. Now, if the majority of the population are serfs, and they live on the land, and they are tied to the land, 
and they take care of their own needs on the land, or no serfs are going to go into the capitalists' workshops or later their factories to work for them. So the capitalists wanted the labour to be freed, only, uh, or the serfs to be freed, only so they could re-enslave them as wage workers uh, like we are uh, today. Now from the antagonism between the feudal ruling class and the capitalists over this question of who would get to exploit the majority of the population, the idea began to develop among the capitalists, especially as they became richer and more powerful, that they should become the new rulers of society. And this opened up what we call the period of the bourgeois revolutions. Now bourgeois is a, is a French word, it's, it's, for the purposes of today we can understand bourgeois to mean capitalist. So a period of capitalist revolutions. Because the capitalists found that just as today the capitalists won't voluntarily go away and leave the working class to run society, also the feudal ruling class wasn't willing to just go away and give up their wealth and their control of society to make way for the capitalists to run society. So the capitalists realised that they had to overthrow the feudal ruling class. Now, the earliest attempt of the capitalists to do this was what we call the German Peasant War, which was in 15. 24, 1525. Uh, Engels, uh, Marx's co-thinker, even wrote a book about this. Um, but it was defeated. It was too early. The, the capitalist class were too weak. They hadn't really come together yet. And that revolution or, was defeated. But the first successful bourgeois revolution was what we call the Dutch Revolt, <laughs> uh, which started in 1566. The capitalists took their time back then, comrades, and was finished in 1609 and this created the first ever capitalist republic in world uh, history and the, this is in the area that today is, is, is Holland and the Netherlands and they succeeded in winning independence from the Spanish Empire um, and we mention this one in particular because of course it's from the Netherlands that the Afrikaners originally came from. Now remember they arrived in South Africa in 1652 and Rebeck came to Cape Town and it's not an accident that the capitalists came to power in 1609 and within 40 years they were knocking at your door to come and take over South Africa and oppress you. It's because capitalism and imperialism go hand in hand together. It didn't really occur to anyone in Europe before the capitalist revolutions to go and invade black countries or to take over Africa. It was the capitalist class, it was the project of the capitalist class. Now, the second bourgeois revolution, we, like I say, it's an overview, we don't have time to go more into it, we're going to skim over, was the English uh, Civil War, which took place uh, shortly after the Dutch Revolt. It began in 1642 and ended in 1651. And here, comrades, is where we're going to get interactive again with the video because we thought that the comrades might want to see, okay, what does a bourgeois revolution look like? Now, they didn't have TV cameras back then, so it's not original footage, <laughs> um, but they made an excellent movie in the 1970s, uh, which was very accurate, historically, of, uh, of how the English Civil War took, uh, took place. So, it's, it's about, um, I think this one's about 15 minutes long. So, so you see what we mean from the video that the capitalist class was revolutionary in its youth because you know Cromwell, the guy that was leading the army, he was an MP. Can you imagine any of the MPs in Parliament today <laughs> leading an army uh, like that? Uh, they were also very bold. They were willing to you know, chop this guy's head off. Whereas today's capitalists, they can't even arrest the Guptas. But more generally though, because that question of the Parliament because that legacy is still with us today. Because you saw that at the start, Charles walked into Parliament and he thought, close it. Because that was what they had done for hundreds and hundreds of years. But at a certain point, the capitalists said, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're in charge of this country. And that remains the case. Because in South Africa, um, who is above Parliament? Now, we have a head of state, it's uh, Ramaphosa. But he's elected by Parliament. In theory, he's accountable to Parliament. No one is above the Parliament. And that whole situation only exists because 
of the events uh, that took place uh, in the video there. But of course, the problem that we've got as the working class is that, like it said in the slides, the ordinary people couldn't vote for that parliament. That was a parliament of the capitalist class. Now it's true that the, everyone has a vote today, but we would argue, and we'll explain later in the workshop, that that is still a parliament in Cape Town, that is still a parliament of the capitalist class. It's a democratic appearance to hide the economic dictatorship of the capitalist class through their control of the economy. Now, another word of caution is, of course, in the movie, they focused on the two leading characters, Charles I versus uh, Oliver Cromwell. Um, but of course, we must be very clear that it wasn't a personal conflict. Those two individuals, they were just the foremost representatives of big social classes, and it was a class, a conflict uh, of the classes. So to move on now, so that was the second bourgeois revolution. The third bourgeois re revolution was what we call the American War of Independence, which started in 1775, so we're 100, 100 years further up the road now, uh, and ended in 1783. This revolution had a twist to it, because at this time, before 1775, America was a colony of Britain. The British, after Cromwell came to power, started sending people to America to conquer America. So America was a colony of England. And although Britain had already 100 years earlier had its bourgeois revolution, they were exploiting their American colony in a semi-feudal way. They were putting heavy taxes on the ordinary people there, but they would not give them any representation in that parliament that they had fought for. So they didn't learn the lessons of their own history because then the American capitalist class wouldn't tolerate that. And they rose up in order to win independence from Britain and create their own capitalist uh, republic. The final bourgeois revolution, or let me say the final bourgeois revolution of the classic period was the great French Revolution, uh, which happened almost at the same time as the American War of Independence. And this was the most decisive of the bourgeois revolutions, like I say, the classic bourgeois revolution, because it was fought through to a more decisive conclusion. And what I mean by that is 10 years uh, after the English Civil War, even though they'd killed the king, they had a republic, i.e. A, a country with no king, for 10 years, but then they brought back uh, the son of that executed king. But they allowed him to go back on the throne only on condition that Parliament remained above him now. He was a ceremonial uh, face. Um, but in, um, in France, they too executed their king, Louis XVI, but they didn't stop at the king. They killed, uh, they estimate, historians estimate, around 16,000 representatives of the feudal ruling class to make sure that feudalism was well and truly finished. Uh, All right, so there's a summary of the four bourgeois revolutions. The Dutch Revolt, the English Civil War, the American War of Independence, and the French Revolution. The way history worked out, the Dutch Revolt is here, England is here, France is here, and of course America. So you have this nice area where the capitalist class was now in control of that area of the world. Uh, and because they were all close, you know, you could consolidate your control of the world there. They still had wars with each other. It's not like they cooperated, but they were in control of that uh, corner uh, of the world. What this did was it cleared the way for what we call the Industrial Revolution. Now the comrades might be hearing at the moment on the news they talk about the fourth industrial revolution a lot. Well, what was the first industrial revolution? It was here. So the first industrial revolution first started in Britain. Again, you needed capitalism before you could have the development of industry. So in Britain, after they'd had the Civil War, technology began to develop more quickly. And from the 1780s onwards, the um, uh, industrial revolution began to develop. And it was based on the introduction of steam power. But before electricity in general, you had steam. So you would boil water like in the kettle and the pressure of the, the steam would push the machinery uh, and that um, developed the, the economy. Uh, it allowed for large scale uh, mechanized industry, which revolutionized the economy and revolutionized the means of production. And this transformed uh, society. Now, 
It started in England, but it wasn't limited to England. Uh, it's hard to see this map. This is Europe turned to the side. But it shows all these dots are areas where modern industry began to develop. And we're talking about coal mines, about uh, factories. But you see that they're clustered in Britain, but then also in uh, Holland. Of course, the capitalists are in power there, but also in Germany. Now, the capitalists are not in power in Germany yet, but capitalism is beginning to develop within the remaining feudal, feudal system over there. Industry even begins to develop as far away as, uh, as Russia over here, and we'll return to Russia. Now, what was unique about capitalism that allowed the Industrial Revolution to begin and then to move very quickly was that it was the first class society in history where the ruling class, the capitalist class, reinvested the, uh, the wealth that they exploited from their workers, that they reinvested it back into industry. Um, in the past, you know, people like Charles I, they would take all that uh, wealth from the peasants, from the serfs, and they would just live in their nice palaces and wear their silly hats with the feathers and the rest of it. But capitalism was the first system where the surplus was reinvested in the production process itself. And that had the effect of pushing technology very quickly and very rapidly. So the early capitalists, the ones that we saw in the video, like I warned you, they didn't look like today's capitalists, Cromwell and those other guys. The Industrial Revolution transformed them into the modern capitalist class of industrialists, of bankers, of owners of the modern uh, economy. Uh, also, the modern uh, working class of wage labourers us emerged in the course of the Industrial Revolution. There's a second five minute video clip about that. So this is just to give the comrades, because I've tried to describe it, but it's better if you can see at least a bit what that looked like and why it was important. Those last two clips, the actual video, you know, of the factories, that's what it would have been like as well in the early Industrial Revolution, you know, when they only had the, photo, the, the photographs. But you can imagine what an impact this had on society. Before steam and before electricity, human and animal power was the, uh, the main source of, of power. Um, if a human or an ox or a horse couldn't push or pull something, then that was it, uh, really. There was some limited use of water, but uh, that was it. And that kept, under feudalism, that kept the scale of production very small and it kept work individual you know you would have artisans who would have their own set of hand tools you know hammers chisels who would have their own workshops who would make a table or whatever from, from a block of wood all the way through to a table but now here's assembly lines where hundreds of workers or in the case of china there do you know in that factory in china do you know how many workers are in that that one factory it's 17,000 one seven thousand seventeen thousand so it completely changed society, the Industrial Revolution. And just quickly, what do Marxists think about the Industrial Revolution? Well, it created us, so we can't be too uh, angry with it. But one important point is that Marxists, we don't want to turn back the wheel of history. Um, because what we argue uh, is that socialism only becomes a possibility by building on top of the economic achievements of capitalism, what we saw in the video, of picking up where the capitalists have left uh, things. So all of those factories, all of the products that are made from them, uh, they're made by our class. Those were our Chinese brothers and sisters there uh, in the factory. They're struggling to build trade unions at the moment. They live under a dictatorship that's trying to stop them. Um, so we don't want to burn down those things. We want to take them over for the working class. What we've discussed so far was to set the scene for Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And we're going to go back um, to them now. Remember, we started in 1848. The wave of revolutions this side of Europe, but those revolutions were defeated. They were revolutions against feudalism. They were trying to do what they had done to the king in England, chop off the heads of the old ruling class. But the revolutions were defeated. And what should have happened, 1848, it should have been 
a second wave of bourgeois revolutions to clear out feudalism uh, in the rest of, of, of Europe. But as we explained, things had changed in society now. It was 200 years later from the English Civil War. It was 70 years later since the French uh, bourgeois revolution. And as we said, the Industrial Revolution had created the modern working class. The enormous factories uh, and other workplaces owned by the capitalists that we saw in that video, they were creating what we call class consciousness amongst the workers. So the working class, like the capitalists, was growing up. They were becoming adults. In that first wave of bourgeois revolutions, the, the masses were not sufficiently developed, or the working class was still a baby. They couldn't act independently as a class, so they followed behind the capitalists, and they mobilised them to fight their battles for them. You can imagine in, in Cromwell's army there, the army that he led, they weren't all capitalists, were they? They, they were ordinary people that had been mobilised by lies to fight on behalf uh, of the capitalists. Now, Marx pointed this out, and he said that at this stage... The proletarians, proletarian comrades, is a, another word for working class. Uh, so in the, in the first bourgeois revolutions, Marx said, at this stage, the proletarians do not fight their enemies, they fight the enemies of their enemies. The French working class, or French working class ancestors, were mobilised with the slogan liberty, equality and fraternity. The South African working class was mobilised behind the, uh, the South African aspirant black capitalist class with the ideas of the Freedom Charter, nationalise the wealth, share the wealth amongst the people, return the land to the people. But in practice, what the capitalists had meant is that they wanted liberty, equality and fraternity only within their own class. There was no liberty for the working class in the terrible conditions of those early factories. Marx called the early factories the dark satanic mills, or in the working class slums that existed in all the European cities at that time. I don't know if the comrades know, but in the industrial cities of the early uh, revolution, remember all these points on the map here, um, life expectancy, if you were a worker, was 24 years of age. They worked you so hard, and the pollution, the heat, the chemicals, the dangerous chemicals, there was no health and safety then. The, the, the average age that the workers would die at was 24. Now, the, the capitalists had promised liberty, equality, fraternity, democracy. But what happened after the bourgeois revolutions? Well, the workers didn't get their votes. Things remained like they did with Cromwell's parliament. Only people who owned property could vote. So the workers were denied the vote. Women were denied the vote. Uh, the black slaves, we don't have time to touch on the slave trade, but the slave trade was a very important uh, thing that developed capitalism. Um, that was immediately before the Industrial Revolution. The slave trade created the wealth to then invest to create the Industrial Revolution. We'll have to save that for another day. But capitalism had its own system of slavery in America, in the southern states, in the, in the Caribbean islands of what is today Cuba and Haiti. And the slaves remained slaves. So this capitalist liberty was a very strange uh, thing. Um, so now, if you go to 1848... The working class is realising this and they're beginning to put forward its own independent class programme and the ideas of socialism and the ideas of communism. For the purposes of this school, comrades, socialism and communism, we can treat them as the, as the same thing. But ideas that only the working class would support are beginning to find uh, support. With the growth of industry, it's now obvious to the workers in those big factories that the workers do not have the same interests as the bosses, even if they did have a shared enemy in the remaining elements of the feudal ruling class that still existed in parts of uh, Europe. Therefore, in the 1848 revolutions, history was not going to repeat itself. The masses were not going to follow behind the capitalists just to help the capitalists into power. So the question of what social system would replace feudalism in the 1848 revolutions was at the front of those revolutionary movements. So you can imagine, if this was a meeting of the revolutionary movement, half the room would be workers saying, hey, we want, after we get rid of the king, after we get rid of feudalism, we want 
to own the economy together. We want socialism. And the capitalists on the other side said, no, 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 that won't work. No, no, we must own the economy. And so the thing was beginning um, to break down. We could say that the capitalist class wanted to end feudalism, to give full freedom to the unlimited accumulation of wealth through its ownership of the new industrial means of production. But workers were demanding freedom from all forms of exploitation, whether it was feudal exploitation or capitalist exploitation. And more and more they demanded not only the end of feudalism, this is the workers, but the abolition of private property in the economy entirely. And of course the private property was the very foundation of the capitalist class's existence, so they were not going to agree uh, on, on that. So like I say, the old coalition between the working class and the capitalist class, never really a coalition, it's a uh, loose term that I'm using, it collapsed in the 1848 revolutions. Uh, the capitalist class wanted power for itself, but now here was the working class ready to leap over its head and usher in a complete social revolution, sweeping away feudalism and the capitalist class. And I've got a big quote here, but it summed it up nicer than I could. There's a, a Marxist historian called, well, he's dead now, but called Eric Hobsbawm. Um, and he wrote a book about these revolutionary movements. And he said, uh, he said the following. Of the main social groups involved in the 1848 revolution, the bourgeoisie, i.e. the capitalist class, discovered that it preferred order to the chance of implementing its full programme i.e. the complete abolition of feudalism, when faced with the threat to property. Confronting red revolution, that's, red is that the colour of socialism, moderate capitalist liberals and feudal conservatives drew together. In 1848-1849, moderate capitalist liberals therefore made two important discoveries. The revolution was dangerous and that some of their demands against feudalism, especially on economic matters, could be met without it. The bourgeoisie ceased to be a revolutionary force. So this is you know, a, a, a historical moment that the capitalist class for two or three hundred years had been a revolutionary force, pushing society forward. But in 1848, it joined the ranks of the reactionary classes, of the classes that were holding back the development uh, of society. And it was here to rejoin Karl Marx where the Communist Manifesto was slightly ahead of its time. Um, and we often say that the job of a Marxist is to always be a bit ahead of the march of history so that we can anticipate how it goes. So Marx and Engels, so we're going into them now, had been working on the Communist Manifesto since mid-1847. And it was published only a few weeks, I think two or three weeks, before the 1848 revolutions uh, began. And it not only anticipated that the working class must separate from the capitalist class, but it boldly proclaimed that the, time, that the time for a fiercely independent working class movement, both ideologically, in terms of the ideas that guided it, but also organisationally, in terms of workers' parties and trade unions, that the time for that uh, had arrived. Now, Marx and Engels had been developing the philo philosophical foundations of their ideas, the ideas of Marxism, since about 1843, and we call that dialectical materialism. We don't have time to examine that in this day school. But the manifesto, the communist manifesto, it presented the conclusions of those philosophical studies in a practical form to arm the working class movement. And the communist manifesto, it remains a treasure trove of ideas for today, even though it's 170 years old. But we only have time to touch on a few of the key points that are in it. Now, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels sketched out brilliantly the key features of the new industrial capitalism. But it was their emphasis on the revolutionary role of the working class which made the Communist Manifesto a true manifesto. It was a call to arms of the working class to fight for its own interests. The manifesto, one of the early, one of the first sentences in it, is the famous phrase that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. Hitherto is an old-fashioned English word, it just means up until now. And in the manifesto, Marx and Engels described the different class societies that come before capitalism. But they pointed out that with capitalism, 
there were a few unique features. And the first one was that capitalism massively simplified the class structure of society. Now, we didn't have time to go into it, but under feudalism, it wasn't just the feudal class and the capitalist class and then the exploited masses. There were huge different grades of feudal classes. You had the church aristocracy, the old uh, Catholic church and its aristocracy. You had the kings, or rather you had emperors at the top. Then you had kings, then you had princes. Most of Germany was run by princes, third level down. Then you had lords, you had knights. You know, you've seen knights with the swords, a bit like Cromwell. And they had their own rights. Then you had, within the oppressed masses, you had the serfs that we mentioned. But you had what were called journeymen, which were somewhere between workers, peasants, and even capitalists. You had rich peasants, you had poor peasants. Dozens of different classes that made up the feudal system. But capitalism simplified all that. Under capitalism, there are only two classes really worth talking about. The capitalist class and the working class. Now, you do have the middle class. We don't need to worry too much about them. They just they, they do what uh, Cromwell and the French Revolution did with liberty, equality and fraternity. Uh, or that the ANC did with the Freedom Charter. They create excuses for capitalism. They explain to you, oh, but if we, you know, we must use our constitution, we must use our parliament, we must use our, you know, as if these things are ours and not the capitalists. So they, their role is to confuse the class issues. But they can't play an independent role. All of the history of capitalism shows the middle class, even though they like to pretend that they lead things, you go to NGO workshops and all those things, the, the middle class actually follows either the capitalist class or the working class. But then there was something further that was unique about capitalism that Marx and Engels explained in the Communist Manifesto. Now, in past class struggles, as the comrades were explaining and as we saw, um, past class struggles, one exploiting minority tried to replace another exploiting minority, like uh, the capitalist class trying to replace the feudal class. And the vast majority of the population remained exploited. But there was something new in capitalism. The working class, standing on the achievements of the Industrial Revolution, had the potential to stop the merry-go-round, to end the division of society into classes once and for all, and abolish all forms of class exploitation. So, for the first time, society was at the threshold of ending class exploitation once and for all. And that was because, when you looked at the question, the only way that you could possibly organise society after the overthrow of capitalism, with the huge industry that's been created, would be on the basis of collective ownership, of economic planning, and the ideas that I explained right at the start of the workshop. So Marx explained that, of all the classes that stand face-to-face -face with the bourgeoisie today, the proletariat alone is the really revolutionary class, because it's only the working class that has an interest in creating this classless society. The middle class, well, they tend to own small businesses, or so they're a bit nervous away with property. They're a bit nervous about that. They can't be relied on. So it's only the working class that has an interest in ending class society uh, once and for all. Now, that's the, the, the other famous phrase, is that Marx then said, therefore, what the bourgeoisie produces, above all, is its own grave diggers. By creating the Industrial Revolution, they called into being a huge population, us, who has an interest in overthrowing them. So the capitalists' rush to expand production, to increase their wealth, continuously increases the numbers of the working class, which, like we say, developed a class consciousness among the workers, leading on to independent working class organisation, trade unions, and later workers' parties. And the very conditions that the working class lived in made the ideas of socialism and of communism almost common sense to us. You know, even when we talk, before we've had these workshops in the EPWP, the idea that they must find the money. We don't care. They must find the money. They must make the money available. If they own it, then they must share it with us. Even in the car driving here, we were talking about those ideas. You know, that the money must be used by all of us. So the ideas, of, that's the socialist idea. The ideas of socialism, because of the, the life that we live as the working class, it becomes almost common sense uh, to us when we, uh, when we hear it. So the manifesto then deals with the question of what role should Marxists, so those people who 
know what Marx has said, who understand the ideas, who understand this history, what, uh, what role should the Marxists play? What role should a party like the MWP play to assist the mass of the working class to understand these ideas and draw revolutionary uh, conclusions? Now, first of all, Marx and Engels said that the Marxists, let's see, well, they called them the communists as well, Marxist communist at this time. Later it will mean the SA Communist Party, and that's a different thing. But at this point in history, communist and Marxist can mean almost the same thing. Is that the communists have no interests separate and apart from those of the proletariat, the working class as a whole. So Marxists are not a bunch of careerists who want to do what the capitalists did, be a privileged elite that then tells the working class what to do, like you could argue some of the trade union, the rich, highly paid trade union leaders are uh, today. But then Marx went on to say, as well, that the communists are distinguished from the other working class parties by this only. In the national struggles of the proletariat, of the different countries, they point out and bring to the front the common interests of the entire proletariat, independently of all nationality. And number two, in the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeoisie has to pass through, they, the communists, the Marxists, always and everywhere represent the interests of the movement as a whole. Now, these are very crucial points. They're 170 years old, but we still take these two points as the starting point today of working out our tactics in the, in, the class, uh, in the class struggle. And you could sum up both points as meaning that always and everywhere the task of Marxists is to strive, is to fight for the maximum unity of the working class in struggle. Now, in that first point there, uh, Marx and Engels are making it clear that regardless of what country a worker is born in, and don't forget, every country was created by the capitalists, none of them are, were there forever. Whatever country you're born in, the workers have a common interest. We've got common interests with those Chinese workers we saw in the video. Those Chinese workers have a common interest with the South African workers that were in uh, the video. In other words, the working class must not be divided by nationality. The struggle of the working class is a global struggle against the world capitalist system, and that demands the unity of the working class on an international scale. In fact, Marx thought this point was so important that the, the manifesto ends with another famous phrase. Workers of all countries unite was the, the last sentence of the Communist Manifesto. Now today, uh, we could extend nationality to also mean the working class must not be divided by gender, uh, by race, by tribe, by sexuality, or any of the other lines that the capitalists could divide us by. But you can see how this would inform up the position that we take on issues today. Because if we are basing ourselves on these ideas, what attitude would we take to xenophobia in the townships, for example? Would we say that the Pakistani shop owner or the Somali shop owner is the enemy of the workers? Or is it someone else, maybe, the capitalist class? So the second point here could be summarised as we will never take a position as Marxists that supports robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's always a trap that the movement can fall in, into. And that's what this second point uh, really means, that we won't allow one section of the working class to be played off against another section. We won't tolerate divide and rule strategies from the capitalist uh, class. So just to look at that a bit more, now it's true that the working class internationally has one common interest, but it does have different layers to it. And obviously we see that in the EPWP. We've got the uh, DID workers, we've got the community health workers, we've got these early childhood development workers. Then if you go into the workplaces, then you've got the permanent staff uh, as well. Uh, but then the permanent staff isn't just exactly the same. You've got high paid, you've got low paid, you've got some that are paid to be managers, others are paid to work, you've got skilled workers, unskilled workers, and so on. And so the role of Marxists is always to try and unite all these different parts of the working class around their common uh, interests. So, for example, that video we watched at the start of the EPWP campaign, if you could hear 
what uh, the comrades were saying in their speeches. Uh, for example, Wisely was saying, uh, calling for the unity of the struggles in the workplaces, the struggles in the communities, the struggles in the education, in the schools and the universities. He was saying that because he's been trained in the ideas of Marxism, that we have to always push forward the idea of unity. And if you look at the bulletins that we've produced as the MWP, you will find exactly that same method. Uh, you will never find in there that we argue only for the interest, the narrow interest of the EPWPs. We don't say to the departments, sack, uh, sack a thousand permanent workers so the money is available to employ the EPWPs. Or cut the salaries of the permanent workers so we can raise the stipends of the EPWPs. You will never find anything like that in, in uh, Marxist material. What we will talk about, in order to unite all the different parts of the working class, is the common enemy of all the workers. So the bosses and the managers in the departments will talk about driving out the corruption in the public sector. Because EPWPs, CHWs, permanent stuff, they've all got a common interest in doing that. We'll talk about the 1.4 trillion rand that the capitalists have in their bank accounts. We'll talk about nationalising the banks and the mines to make the wealth available to satisfy the needs of all the sections of workers. That we don't have to choose, will we satisfy the EPWPs or will we satisfy the permanent staff? No, we'll put forward a programme so that everyone's needs uh, can, uh, can be met. So I bet the Commons didn't realise this is now we're trying to bring it back down to earth is that the ideas that we've used to guide the EPWP campaign in the bulletins and speeches are informed by this document, by what Karl Marx said uh, here. And there's a short clip here of them writing the manifesto. And so it's Marx and Engels uh, and Marx's wife, uh, Jenny, uh, who was also a revolutionary. You'll notice in these early years the women are not given uh, much of a front role, but they were there. I don't think they weren't there. They were there. Um, what's the phrase? That behind every great man is a great woman. Well, Jenny Marx. <laughs> Jenny Marx is there. So it's, it's got subtitles. So I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll read them because they're very small. So they're speaking in German, but I'll read the English subtitles. Yeah, there was some complicated English there. I know. <laughs> and, and that's from German. <laughs> um, so, to come back to the story then, so armed with those ideas in the Communist Manifesto, and there's more, I've given you some of the key ones that still inform us. Marx and Engels played an active part in the 1848 revolutions. They, they were in Germany at the time, they published a radical newspaper, that's where we get the tradition of doing our magazine, a radical newspaper which ruthlessly exposed the treachery of the capitalist class and encouraged the working class to independent organisation to drive forward those revolutions against the feudals. Now, in the revolution, Marx was arrested several times by the so-called revolutionary capitalist governments, only proving his point that they were now a reactionary class. He even stood trial, but he was acquitted by the jury because he made such a convincing case for socialism and for communism, that the jury uh, found him not guilty of treason against the new capitalist uh, governments. But with the defeat of the revolutions, like it said in the video, Marx and Engels were forced into exile. They couldn't stay where they were. Everyone was out to get them now because of the dangerous ideas that they were putting forward. So they moved to London, uh, the capital of England, where there were more political freedoms because England had not been involved in those revolutions because it was more developed. It didn't have to deal with feudalism uh, anymore. So before uh, we go any further, we're going to stay with Marx's key uh, ideas. Now at the end there, it said that Marx, until his death, he kept on writing his, uh, his other great work, which is called Das Kapital. He spent 20 years uh, working on it. It was only published in 1867. So he arrived in London in 1849, after the defeat of the revolutions, and started researching and writing the book uh, Capital. And like the Communist Manifesto, but on a grander scale, Capital is a treasure trove of ideas, and we can only pluck a few of those key ideas to look at. And in Capital, Marx explained exactly how capitalism works and how the working class is exploited. 
So Marx started capital by examining what we call uh, a commodity. I think comrades have heard that, that word. But it has a, an exact meaning. What exactly is a commodity? A commodity is something that is made by human labour, but it's made for sale, not for the use of the person that made it. So in the case of modern industry, neither the workers in the factory, like we saw, those cars, where did they go? They got on a train and went off to Germany or wherever they went. Neither the workers nor the capitalists that made those uh, things uses them. They are sent to the shops to be sold to complete strangers. And that's basically what a commodity is. And whilst there had always been some commodity production in earlier societies, King Charles didn't make his expensive candlesticks or his expensive gold plates. So the, the feudal court would have bought those from uh, artisans in the feudal system. So although there had been commodity production earlier, capitalism, what made it different and unique, was that it was a system of what we call generalised commodity production. And what we could say that means is that everything is for sale. Absolutely everything can be bought with, uh, with money, with cash which was the first time in history. I know it's hard to imagine now, but that was a new thing with capitalism. Now, another decisive, and these are linked, a necessary feature of capitalism that Marx explained was the complete separation of the worker from the means of production. And again, this was new. The serfs of the feudal system, although they were exploited, they had direct access to the means of production. They uh, had access to land to produce for their own needs, uh, the artisans of the small-scale feudal workshops would own their own tools uh, and their own workshops. But under capitalism, the workers have no access to the means of production. The vast factories, the huge assembly lines, all the things we saw in those videos are the property of the capitalist class. But something else, because the size of those modern means of production means it's impossible for a worker to own them. You can't set up a car assembly line, like the BMW assembly line, in your garage and turn out cars. So what that meant about capitalism, and this is what Marx is explaining in, in, in Capital, in the book, is that the working class has nothing of value except for their own labour, their ability to labour. And they're forced to sell that to the capitalist class in exchange for wages, which we, we all then use to buy what we call the necessaries of life. So your food, to pay your rent, to pay the school fees, buy your clothes, all the other things that we need to live. So in other words, under capitalism, for the first time, almost all labour in society was also turned into a commodity. Something that is bought and sold. We are forced to sell it and the capitalists buy it. But when a worker sells their labour, it's none of the worker's business what their labour is used for. We get this thing, I think they call it alienation. Um, so you walk into the workplace because the boss is paying you and the boss will tell you exactly what to do to make yourself busy. For the hours that you're at work, the boss owns your time. You're like a puppet and he owns how you're going to use it, how, he, how he's going to use it. And that's why we talk about wage slavery because as soon as you've sold your labour, you're not in control of your own body. You're told what to do by the capitalist. Then... What Marx did next in Capital was he developed what he called the general formula of Capital. Don't worry, comrades, I know you're thinking, oh no, we're doing algebra and maths uh, now. But this is actually quite simple. And he developed this formula to show how the capitalist economy, how in the capitalist economy, and the very nature of commodity production ensured that the working class always had nothing and that the capitalist class would get richer and richer, just from the very basic way that society now organised the economy. So let me just come this side too. So what's going on here? This is, number one is the working class circuit, we call it. This is, this is our lives, comrades. Number two is the capitalist circuit. That's the life, not necessarily of the individual capitalist, but of capital. And C stands for commodity. M stands for money. So if you're a worker, what is your life? And this repeats, by the way. So after C, you go M, C, M, on until you die. You start with a commodity. And what is that commodity? 
It's your labour. Then what do you do? You sell your commodity for money. That's the wages. Then you spend your money on other commodities, the necessaries of life. You buy your food, your clothes, you pay your rent, and then you have nothing left. So you're left with nothing but your labour. You go back to work. You work for your wages. And you do that for the rest of your life. <laughs> the capitalists, they, they have the opposite. The capitalist starts with money, the capital. Then they use their money to buy a commodity. What commodity do they buy? Your labour. Then you make commodities for them, which they then sell. They send it to those BMW cars, put them on the train, send them to the shop. The commodities are sold, and they end up with M, more money. And this little tick here, the reason why it's not just M again, but M with a, uh, a mark, uh, that's to show that they, they end up with more money than they started. So somehow, in number one, the working class, no matter how many times we go through the loop, we still always end up with, with nothing. All right, you can put some savings away, save up to buy, I don't know, a TV, if you're lucky, a car, maybe even a house, but you still ultimately always end up with nothing. The capitalist, however, increases its wealth. And every time they repeat this, so then this M, so let's say that this was 10. When it goes through the process of commodity production, they end up with 12. But then the new M is 12. And you go through it again, you end up with 15. Then you go back to 50. Go through it again, you've got 20, 40, 100. And they get richer and richer and richer. Whilst we are still back where we started. You can simplify the core of the argument with a simple demonstration. We're going to do what's called the money trick. And it'll only be funny if you do so. <laughs> So go on, that's how capitalism works. Yeah. So, just to, to explain exactly what happened there, there's nothing like, that's how capitalism works, go on. And the trick that the capitalists are playing is that they are paying you for the five rands that I give to the workers. I'm paying you for what Marx called labour power. And what we mean by labour power is um, your ability to work. So the energy that you need by having a roof over your head, by having a meal, by having some leisure, bringing up your family, your labour power. And that was represented by one of these strips, your labour power, allowing you to come back to work the next day. But what happened during the working day? Well, the workers produced, the workers need one of these to live. They produced three each for me. But the wage that the comrades received was only one third of what they actually produced. So the great trick of capitalism is that the bosses are paying workers for their labour power, but they are consuming their labour, their ability to work, and they're not the same uh, thing. That trick is then disguised by the wages system. So if in one day you produce three of these, but you're only paid for one, it means that for one third of the day you're working to replace yourself, your own energy, like. And for the other two thirds of the day, you're working for free. But because the capitalist spreads the money across the day and says, I'll pay you 50 cents per hour, he actually disguises the reality that for two thirds of the day, you're working for free for the capitalist. So capitalism, Marx explained that profits, because those two extra, you could say that that's my profits, is nothing more than the unpaid labour of the working class. And then they tell you that you're lucky to have a job and you're, you should be thankful to them when in fact you're working for free to make, them, uh, to make them rich. So those are the basic ideas in capital that we wanted to look at. Like I said, there's lots more ideas about the reserve army of unemployment. Just like uh, with wage labour, the capitalists pretend that they're upset about unemployment, but they need unemployment. The system needs unemployment. So we'll never get rid of unemployment under capitalism. That's why we need to fight for socialism. But anyway, to move on, comrades. So, whilst Marx and Engels were in exile in London, they weren't just locked away in the study, writing capital, making their studies to be able to explain how capitalism works. They were trying to 
make the call at the end of the manifesto, Workers of the World Unite, a reality. So in 1864, they founded an organisation called the First International. And strictly speaking, it wasn't the very first communist or Marxist uh, organisation. Because Marx and Engels, they'd been part of an organisation called the Communist League, which existed between 1847 and 1852. In fact, it was the Communist League which commissioned the Communist Manifesto. That's whose manifesto it was, the Manifesto of the Communist uh, League. But the First International succeeded in putting flesh upon the spectre, the ghost of communism, that the Communist Manifesto had spoken of. It succeeded in placing the idea of international working class unity at the heart of the workers' movement. And that idea uh, has, never, uh, has never gone away. Um, now, the International, like I said, was founded in 1864, and it had some important successes, especially in a strike wave that swept Europe in 1866. Many of the workers that led those strikes were members of the International. Also, the British trade unions. Britain, Britain was the first country to have, uh, country to have the basic organisations of the working class, the trade unions, the idea of trade unions, and the building of trade unions started... Uh, in Britain uh, as well. And the British trade unions, they affiliated to the First International. So it was able to sink important roots in Britain through the trade unions, but also in the organisations of the working class, particularly in France, in Switzerland, uh, in Germany uh, as well. And what began to happen during these... Uh, how many years is that? Eight years? Eight years? Uh, it was that the ruling class began to lay every problem that they faced at the feet of the international and its agitators, whether or not they were behind this strike, whether or not they were behind this protest. The ruling class would blame everything on the first international. And this was especially the case in France in 1871, where we move now, and the events of what was called the Paris Commune. France had been defeated in a war with Prussia. That's France. So remember, France is capitalist already. And Prussia is this country here. And what was happening is that the leader of Prussia was fighting a war to unify all of the small German countries, the ones that, that we talked about, uh, into one united German country. But to do that, they had to get some territory off of France. So they were fighting against the French, and they had won. They defeated the French. The Ger Germany was created the next year uh, after this. So what happened was the emperor of France was a, called Louis Bonaparte. He was called the emperor, but that was just a name. He was a sort of capitalist ruler of France. Um, had been captured, and a new uh, republican capitalist government had come to power to replace him. And the victorious Prussian army was demanding that that territory of France be given over to the new Germany and that France pay war reparations. You know, they wanted to be compensated for the money they had spent on, on the war. And a five-month siege of the capital city of France, Paris, which is that dot there, uh, began. Now, the old French regime's army had collapsed, and so the defence of Paris, because remember the, Prussians are, the Prussian army is at the gates, the defence of Paris was taken up by armed militias an armed militia called the National Guard, which was staffed, the people that were in the militia, were the working class of uh, Paris. And this self-organisation of the working class, an armed self-organisation at that, really scared the new French government that was trying to make peace with the Prussians. And they eventually agreed to an armistice with the Prussians. And then the French government called a new election. And the, government, the new government that came in was filled with fresh conservative forces and they, scared of the National Guard and the self-organisation of the Paris working class decided to disarm the Paris working class they'd kept having protests and uh, strikes and so on but they had guns, they were armed and they, they were nervous so they moved to try and disarm them, to take the weapons off them and that step gave spark to an uprising of the working class in Paris who took control of the entire city and set up their own government. And that government was called the Paris Commune. This was a landmark 
uh, event, despite its limitations. Uh, and those limitations were that it was only in one city, that it only lasted 60 days, this new government. It was then crushed by the French and the Prussian armies. But what was significant about the Paris Commune was it was the first time in world history that the working class had taken power anywhere. And it proved that everything that Marx, that Engels, that the First International was saying about the possibility of a socialist revolution was correct. Indeed, it was decisive proof that the epoch of the bourgeois revolution had ended and the epoch of the proletarian, the working class revolution, uh, had uh, opened. And the Paris Commune was also decisive in further developing the ideas of Marxism, in particular what we call the Marxist theory of the state. Now Marx went on to say that the real secret of the Paris Commune was, this is the quote, it was essentially a government of the working class, the finally discovered political form under which the economic emancipation of labour could take place. And what was that political form? So in other words, we're struggling for the economic freedom of the working class, but when we actually go and try and do that, what will it look like? What will the new political form look like? And the commune answered that. Now, first of all, the commune was based on universal suffrage. So everyone had a vote. Well, we must add, it was still a bit sexist back then. Every man had a vote, not, uh, not the women at this stage. But as we've said, that was still a new idea. You didn't have democracy in most of the world. So the idea that everyone, every man, should be able to vote was a, 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 still a revolutionary idea. And the first thing that the commune did, once it was elected, was it abolished the army, the army that was controlled by the capitalists. And it replaced it with a democratically controlled militia, the, the National Guard. The police force was then stripped of all of its uh, oppressive political functions because the capitalists had been using that to suppress the First International and other communist and working class organisations. They stripped it of its political role. And then they went further. Every state official, so all the people in the national government departments of France at that stage, the equivalent of the DID, Treasury and all the rest, they were all subjected to election. So it would be like if you could go into the DID and elect the DG. Is it the DG, Director General, the Deputy yeah. Director General? That the workers would elect the, the managers. Even the judges were elected. You know, we, the judges are currently appointed by Ramaphosa. The judges were elected uh, as well. And what they did is they introduced the right of immediate recall. So those people that were elected to run the state on behalf of the working class, you didn't have an election cycle. Like we have every five years, right? Every five years you can vote for the MPs. These guys, if the judge messed up, if the DG messed up, immediately you could call him back and elect a new one. You didn't have to wait. <coughs> Further, they made sure that you didn't get corruption and careerism because what they did was that everyone that was elected in the state could only receive the average wage of a skilled worker, of a skilled Paris worker. Now, this super-democratic approach of the Paris working class confirmed what Marx had been saying, that the future society of the working class would build one that, would, that eliminated class divisions because they had turned the state into an extension of the masses. It was no longer a power over the masses. And Marx drew a very clear lesson from this experience. And that was that the workers cannot lay hold, this is how he put it, of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes. In other words, because what the Paris workers did is they didn't go and just copy what the capitalists had done. They stripped the army of power, they stripped the state bureaucracy of power, they stripped the police of power and created new institutions. And so it became clear that what we call a workers' state, which would have those conditions, election of all officials, average wage, right of recall, that a workers' state would be the necessary bridge, the necessary transition <coughs> between capitalist society and socialist society. Uh, and that the workers' state would be a new institution built on the ruins of the capitalist state. The capitalist state, it's a famous phrase as well, must be smashed. Uh, and the capitalist class uh, deprived of the means to crush the socialist revolution by force. 
I'm going to keep underlining this point and tell the comrades that Marx and Engels thought that this point was so important that they added a correction to the Communist Manifesto. Um, because they felt, and you'll see this if you read the Communist Manifesto, they felt that it was too vague on the question of the class character of the state. So they wrote a new preface, so that whenever, you know, a new introduction, so whenever the Communist Manifesto was published after 1871, it always included this new preface explaining the Marxist uh, theory uh, of, uh, of the state. And we must say that this insight of Marx into what made the Paris Commune so important for the Marxist movement um, has been proved in the 150 years since. Because if you look at the history of different revolutions, and after 1871, there's been dozens and dozens of attempts of the working class to follow in the footsteps of the Paris workers, is that every movement that does not have a clear understanding of the class character of the state ends up trying to compromise with it. And then as soon as the capitalists think that the workers are going back to sleep, they will move to crush the revolutionary movement. But if you are not bold in, in replacing the capitalist state, then the revolution is, de is defeated. And that's been uh, demonstrated throughout history. Marx wrote a book on this, summing up the lessons of the Paris Commune. He called it the Civil War in France. It was originally a speech to the First International, but then they turned it into a, uh, into a, a written book. And in there, uh, Marx described the Paris Commune as the herald of a new society. You know, a herald is like one of those angels that blows the trumpet to announce that the Lord has come, you know. So that was what he described the Paris Commune. And although the International had not led the Commune, uh, its members in Paris played a very active role in the, uh, in the Commune, and a very heroic part. And so what happened next is after the Commune was defeated, the entire European ruling classes, as we had capitalists and feudals still, blamed the First International for the Paris Commune, even though they had not really led it, although they had played a role in, uh, in it. And they unleashed a wave of repression against the First International, trying to crush it. Um, now this added to the internal problems that the First International was facing, and internal problems that were starting to tear it apart. And this is an important point for understanding the development of our, under of our ideas for revolutionary organisation. Because you see, the First International, it was not an ideologically unified organisation. The later internationals, later internationals, especially the third and the fourth internationals, were explicitly Marxist. You could only be in those internationals if you were clear on the ideas of Marxism. But of course, the first international was founded in 1864. Marx only published Capital in 1867. So the first international couldn't be a Marxist organisation because Marx's ideas were still being worked out uh, at this time. So within the first international, you had people who based themselves on what we could call pre-Marxist ideas of socialism and of communism. But you also had people that were called anarchists. Uh, you had radical democrats. Uh, you had the trade unionists who were essentially reformist in their outlook. They just wanted to fight to improve the economic situation of the working class and weren't too worried about this question of political power. So the first international brought together all these ideologically uh, Different, uh, different groups. And that was leading to infighting, uh, to conflict within the First International about which ideas should guide it. Now in 1872, which you can see is the last year of the First International, Marx manoeuvred a bit. He was fed up with the infighting. And he moved at the, I think it was their fifth Congress, at the headquarters of the International, which at first had been in Brussels and then were in London. He moved all the way across the Atlantic to New York City in America to remove it from the influence of the infighting that had developed. And slowly over the next year or two, Marx wound up the international. He wanted it to, to stop operating because in his view, it had achieved its historic mission. It had established the idea amongst the working class that you needed an international organisation and you needed the international unity of uh, the working class uh, around the world. And he didn't want that legacy to be poisoned by the infighting that had developed. So the thing uh, was, wound, was wound up. Close that, you are right. Oh, no. Yeah.
Konec. Eh,